Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a video by Veritasium called Why Oppenheimer Deserves His Own Movie. Let's check it out. J. Robert Oppenheimer might be the most important physicist to have ever lived. He never won a Nobel Prize, but he changed the world more than most Nobel Prize winners. Under his leadership, the best physicists of the 20th century built the atomic bomb, forever changing the course of history. If there is another world war, this civilization may go under. He has affected every war waged and every peace settled since the end of World War II. He also created a way for humanity to destroy itself. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. That is an interesting way to be known in, in history for that. Uh, I will add a caveat. We don't actually have enough nuclear weapons to completely destroy the world or even wipe out all of humanity. I know nuclear winter has been discussed at length and even by greats such as Carl Sagan back in the 1980s, but there is a lot of bars of error associated with those estimates that it would indeed destroy all of human civilization. It would be horrific, a full nuclear exchange between the US and the Soviet Union, but Ultimately, there weren't enough nuclear weapons to completely wipe out humanity all in one fell swoop. It would still be horrific, though, and I have no desire to stress test this. This video is about how to build an atomic bomb, the life of Oppenheimer, and why serious scientists were worried about the explosion setting fire to the atmosphere, ending all life on Earth. They weren't seriously worried about it. They did a calculation to prove a point and actually to allay people's or alleviate people's concerns about that. As a nuclear engineer, we often do crazy math in all sorts of situations just to make sure our designs are robust enough. Um, there's a bit of a joke, uh, one plus one equals two for a mathematician. 1 plus 1 equals 2.0 for a scientist who is confident in repeatability of their experiment. 1 plus 1 equals 3 for an engineer, because they know it's 2, but we're going to make it 3 just to ensure we compensate for everything. But for a nuclear engineer, it's 1 plus 1 equals 100, because we want to be absolutely sure we've accounted for every single thing. And this right here with Oppenheimer's team was an example of some 1 plus 1 equals 100 math because we want to be absolutely certain when the risk is extreme of destroying the earth we want to just run a few numbers to say there is no way this could possibly happen and when J. Robert Oppenheimer was 21 he placed an apple laced with toxic chemicals on the desk of his physics tutor the tutor, Patrick Blackett, was an experimentalist, and he had hounded Robert to do more of what he thought Robert wasn't very good at, experimental work. Oppenheimer had already been spending his days in a corner of J.J. Thompson's basement laboratory, attempting to make thin films of beryllium, which were used to study electrons. But Oppenheimer was clumsy, and not good at this work. He was soon avoiding his duties in the lab, spending his time listening to lectures and reading physics journals. It was 1925, and the 21-year-old Oppenheimer was becoming fascinated by the new field of quantum mechanics. Despite being surrounded by brilliant physicists like pretty new Rutherford and Chadwick, Oppenheimer was deeply unhappy. He wrote, I'm having a pretty bad time. The lab work is a terrible bore, and I'm so bad at it that it's impossible to feel that I'm learning anything. I can 100% relate. I felt that way in college. <laughs> a friend walked in on him lying on the floor of his room, which he called a miserable hole, groaning and rolling from side to side in emotional anguish. It was in this state that Robert attempted to poison Blackett. 
The specifics are lost to history. There are conflicting reports if Oppenheimer used cyanide or something he found in the lab which would have just made Blackett sick. This story sounds unbelievable, but Oppenheimer himself confirmed it. Luckily, Blackett did not eat the apple, but the attempted poisoning became known to the Cambridge University authorities. Robert's parents were visiting their son from the US at the time, and Julius Oppenheimer successfully lobbied Cambridge not to press criminal charges. Due to his family's wealth, Robert wasn't even expelled from Cambridge, on the condition that's, that's that he had periodic counseling sessions with a psychiatrist in London. In the summer of 1926, Robert traveled to the University of Göttingen. The chairman of the department was Max Born, who just two years earlier had coined the term quantum mechanics. Born was reportedly a thoughtful and gentle teacher, and had nurtured the work of Werner Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, Enrico Fermi, and Eugene Wigner. Basically, wow. the who's who of quantum mechanics. Yep, that's accurate. The class that Oppenheimer was in was also extraordinary, including luminaries like Paul Dirac and John von Neumann. Mm. Where the academic culture at Cambridge focused on experimental physics, Göttingen was all about theoretical physics. And under Max Born's mentorship, Oppenheimer thrived. His mental health improved, and he found a community of people who were as obsessed with physics as he was. On November 14th, 1926, that must be a weird group of people to hang out with. Probably think of it as, I guess, a 1920s and 30s uh, Big Bang Theory, guys. Robert wrote to Frank, his younger brother, You would like Göttingen. I find the work hard, thank God, and almost pleasant. Robert was <laughs> thriving, pleasant. and his talent was being recognized. Born later wrote, He was a man of great talent, and he was conscious of his superiority in a way which was embarrassing and led to trouble. When Oppenheimer was 23, he graduated with his PhD in physics. He wrote his thesis in German on the quantum theory of continuous spectra. All in all, he published more than a dozen papers in the two years he was at Göttingen. Many of them expanded upon the work of Werner Heisenberg, who was just three years older than Oppenheimer. The two eventually met in 1927, the same year Heisenberg published his groundbreaking paper on the quantum uncertainty principle. By all accounts, the pair got along well. There was no way to know that just 15 years later, they would be deadly rivals, attempting to build the first nuclear bomb, Oppenheimer for the USA, and Heisenberg for Nazi Germany. Mm. At the time, it was thought that getting significant amounts of energy out of radioactive atoms was impossible. For the record, not actually green rocks, if they're talking about uranium here. This could just be an illustration, though. Ever since the discovery of radioactivity by Henri Becquerel, Marie, and Pierre Curie in the late 1890s, it was known that radioactivity was a passive process. Unstable atoms... It's interesting is units of radioactivity are actually... Curies and Becquerels, and a Curie is something like 37 billion times bigger than a Becquerel. Decay at random, unpredictable times. And surely there was no way to control that. In 1933, Ernest Rutherford, Oppenheimer's old boss from Cambridge, wrote <laughs> that anyone who expects a source of power from the transformations of these atoms is talking moonshine. That same year, Albert Einstein said that <laughs> there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. This is always fascinating when you have other prominent scientists discredit something. Like um, Lord Kelvin, um, by many whom consider to be the uh, father of thermodynamics, concluded that heavier than air flying machines were impossible about 20 years before the Wright brothers built the first airplane. It's fascinating when this sort of thing happens. So how would you break an atomic nucleus? Well, you could take a proton and accelerate it through a large electric field and then smash it into a nucleus. This is exactly what John Cockroft and Ernest Walton did in 1932. They accelerated protons into lithium nuclei, breaking them apart. The pair would later win a Nobel Prize for this work. But a proton is positively charged, yeah. so it's repelled by all nuclei which are also positively charged. So to give them a hope of overcoming this barrier, Cockcroft and Walton had to use 250,000 volts to accelerate the protons. 
Even then, I'm gonna say that's the only way to do it, get a very big voltage in order to pull something off like that. About one in a billion protons actually hit and split a lithium nucleus. So this would not be an effective way to get energy. No. But there is another way. Not to mention that uh, small nuclei such as uh, lithium don't yield that much energy per fission. You want to do fission on heavy nuclei, such as uranium, plutonium. Small nuclei, you're actually gonna get more energy out of fusion. So lithium is actually good fusion fuel and is used in some cases in uh, thermonuclear bombs, the successors to um, Oppenheimer's atomic bomb that use the heat from fission to induce nuclear fusion and create an even more crazy bomb. A bit ahead of their time. In 1932, the neutron was discovered, this subatomic particle that's about 0.1% heavier than a proton, and it has no electric charge. So a neutron would not be repelled from a nucleus. And in 1933, Leo Szilard was thinking about how you could use neutrons to split nuclei. Yep, that, ne that uh, absence of charge would make it easier. By the way, a neutron actually decays into a proton and an electron if you just have a free neutron. Its half-life is very short for about 15 minutes, but it's probably going to get absorbed by something else or collide into something in the case of a nuclear reactor before that, that actually happens. But that's why neutrons are bigger than protons. It suddenly occurred to me that if we could find an element which is split by neutrons and which would emit two neutrons when it absorbed one neutron, such an element, if assembled in sufficiently large mass, could sustain a nuclear chain reaction. It's actually more than that. I mean, that's, a, that's his guesstimate, but it's actually two point something. So sometimes you get three neutrons. It's, it's a probability function. But the thing is, nobody knew if there was an element that had a kind of nucleus that would do that. On the 29th of January 1939, <laughs> Luis Alvarez, a promising young physicist, was getting a haircut while reading the San Francisco Chronicle. And suddenly, he got out of the- Love the Barber of Seville music, that's awesome. <laughs> ...chair, halfway through the haircut, and ran to Oppenheimer's office. Alvarez read an article about how two German chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, had successfully split an atom of uranium by bombarding it with neutrons. Oppenheimer was not today. impressed. That's impossible, he reportedly told the young Alvarez, <laughs> proceeding to mathematically prove on his blackboard why fission could never be achieved. But the next day, Alvarez had repeated the experiment and invited Oppenheimer to see it. Alvarez later recalled that in less than 15 minutes, he not only agreed that the reaction was authentic, but also speculated that in the process, extra neutrons would boil off that could be used to split more uranium atoms and thereby generate power or make bombs. I'm for generate power, not for making bombs. I'm that type of nuclear engineer. I love these stories of how at first you have a prominent scientist that doesn't even think the thing's gonna, gonna catch on, and then he suddenly sees it and they repeat it. I can understand why scientists are quite skeptical of new discoveries, but I love how he goes from skeptic to, ooh, look at all these really cool things we can do with it. That's just amazing. When a single atom of uranium-235 splits apart, it loses a little bit of mass, which is released as energy, following Einstein's mass-energy equivalence. One thing to clarify, uh, uranium-235 will not always fission into uh, krypton and is it Ba barium. Um, there is a range of what it will fission into. These two are just possibilities. Um, there is a probability distribution, a twin peaked ones of basically things with an atomic mass number of about 90 to things that are around 140. So these are just possibilities, and you can actually get three neutrons, because it's two point something. It's a tiny amount of energy, about 20 times less than the amount required to raise a grain of sand the thickness of a piece of paper. But atoms are also tiny. In a one kilogram lump of uranium, there are about a trillion trillion atoms. I was gonna say, that is per atom. And to compare it to, say, burning coal or natural gas, Per instance here, you're getting on the order of many millions of times more powerful. The energy quickly adds up. 
Soon, almost everyone was convinced. In August of 1939, Einstein, who just six years earlier believed that nuclear bombs were impossible, signed his name to a letter addressed to President Franklin there you Roosevelt. Go, buddy. The letter, actually written by Zillard, warned Roosevelt of the possibility of nuclear weapons. It also pointed out that Germany had access to uranium from the mines in Czechoslovakia, which was recently taken over by the Nazis. Roosevelt began an informal uranium committee to discuss this topic, but then for two years, nothing happened. Mm. In 1941, Roosevelt upgraded the informal uranium committee to the S-1 committee, which would report directly to the White House. The explicit goal was to develop an atomic bomb. And in May 1942, Oppenheimer was hired onto the committee to be the coordinator of rapid rupture. That is an awesome name. I love how these secret projects get awesome names. Um, and yeah, this would have been super secret, um, secret meetings. No one, no, no one has a clue what they're talking about, except for the president. So why was he selected? Well, after completing his PhD, Oppenheimer became a physics professor, first at UC Berkeley and then at Caltech. The brilliance he had shown under Max Born's tutelage didn't fade. Indeed, it blossomed into a remarkable but strange physics career. In the 15 years after finishing his PhD, Oppenheimer made important contributions to everything from nuclear physics to quantum field theory and even astrophysics. He had a number of Nobel Prize winning ideas. That's a fun job, you gotta love it. One of his students, Willis Lamb, became a Nobel laureate, but Oppenheimer himself was nominated three times, but never actually won the Nobel Prize. When asked why he thought that Oppenheimer never won the Nobel Prize, Murray Gell-Mann said that he didn't have Sitzfleisch, a German word that translates to <laughs> sitting flesh, the ability to sit down in a chair for a long time and do the hard work. He never wrote a long paper or did a long calculation. He didn't have the patience for that. Wolfgang Pauli also said, his ideas are very good, but his calculations are always wrong. <laughs> but Oppenheimer was amazing with people. He was a natural and charismatic leader. And this combination, his charisma and his ability to generate great ideas would serve him well in the next phase of- Yeah. Don't have him be a physicist, have him be a good project manager, which is what he ultimately was for the Manhattan Project. Life. On the 18th of September, 1942, General Leslie Groves was put in charge of the Manhattan Project. I was responsible <laughs> was for the development of the atomic bomb. On day one, he ordered 1,200 tons of uranium ore. The next day, he ordered to That's buy the Oak Ridge site, where the ore would be refined. The next month, in a surprising move, he chose Oppenheimer to be the science director of the soon-to-be-established Los Alamos Laboratory. Oppenheimer had just been selected to be the chief architect of the atomic bomb. Groves was impressed by Oppenheimer. He valued his overwhelming ambition. He also knew that Oppenheimer's ability to understand problems not just in physics, but chemistry, engineering, and metallurgy would be invaluable. Groves thought that Oppenheimer was a real genius, saying that, why? Oppenheimer knows about everything. He can talk to you about anything you bring up. Well, not exactly. He doesn't know anything about sports. The two men couldn't have been more different. Yeah. Oppenheimer weighed half as much as Groves, despite both of them being nearly six feet tall. Ideologically, sure. Oppenheimer was a communist, Groves a staunch conservative. But Groves was convinced that Oppenheimer would be the person that would build the atomic bomb before the Nazis. And that was all that mattered. Isidore Rabi later commented that hiring Oppenheimer for this role was a real stroke of genius on the part of General Groves, who was not generally considered to be a genius. <laughs> Oppenheimer proposed Los Alamos, New Mexico. He had fallen in love with the harsh desert and the mountains of New Mexico when he was in his 20s. In 1929, Oppenheimer wrote to a friend, My two great loves are physics and New Mexico. It's a pity they can't be combined. But Oppenheimer had severely underestimated the logistical challenge ahead. In 1943, Oppenheimer estimated that he'd need about six scientists, supported by a handful of engineers and technicians, to make a bomb. 
he was off by two orders of magnitude. Yeah, just enriching the uranium in order to make a bomb. Because the thing about uranium in two uranium two thirty five has very low natural abundance of less than one percent. To make a bomb, you need over ninety percent. So you're going to need just massive amounts of machinery, centrifuges, operators, technicians, just to do that part. 764 scientists would end up working for the Manhattan Project, 302 of which would work at the Los Alamos site. Over 600,000 people in total were involved with the making of the atomic bomb. Not all 600,000 people knew they were aware they were making the atomic bomb. <laughs> By this point, making the atom bomb didn't seem impossible, it seemed likely. On the 2nd of December 1942, a team of physicists at the University of Chicago, led by Enrico Fermi, created the world's first artificial nuclear reactor, Pile 1. It consisted of 45 tons of uranium and uranium oxide, and 330 tons of graphite blocks. Horrifyingly enough, it was located under the stands of the football field. It generated about half a watt of power. And if you, you gotta start somewhere, and this looks like just some big basic Minecraft block or something, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a real nuclear reactor. To make a nuclear power plant, you can make a bomb. The only real difference between the- No. And again, the main, so nuclear power plants, the enrichment um, you need, you can need only like on the order of two to five percent. So it takes a lot more heavy industry to process the uranium, assuming you want to use uranium to, uh, to make your nuclear bomb. So that's, that's not always the case. Two is how many neutrons hit the next atom, causing it to split and release more neutrons. If on average that number is one, there will be a stable, self-sustaining chain reaction, but it won't grow. If it's less than one, the reaction will die down. And if it's more than one, the reaction will grow. This is known as the multiplication factor, K. Nuclear reactions are similar to pandemics in this way. So the K factor is, so that's a bit of an over global view. There's a few more steps in the neutron fuel cycle, but, uh, if you have, let's just say, if you produce two or three neutrons per fission, that doesn't necessarily mean the reaction is gonna grow because there are other factors, things like control rods, for instance, can absorb some of these extra neutrons that are going around and can essentially keep your fission level constant or critical. That's what critical really means, by the way. Critical doesn't mean something's about to explode. The simplest way to make a nuclear bomb is to get enough fissile material close together that it creates a runaway chain reaction. Fissile means a material that will fission easily under neutrons under, nor under normal conditions like this. That amount is known as the critical mass. With uranium-235, you need about 52 kilograms, forming... So critical mass is different from criticality. Critical mass is just... is. Just pretty much what he said about just getting a massive material to create a self-sustaining reaction like that. Critical mass, uh, this is annoying, but you know, not all of new some of nuclear engineering is a bit confusing that we use the term critical for a steady state nuclear reactor and critical mass when making a weapon. A sphere with a diameter of 17 centimeters. If you use plutonium-239, the critical mass is much smaller, only around 10 kilograms. Plutonium is far more energy dense than uranium, and the sphere, um, the, the sphere density, since, you know, obviously it varies by a factor of something raised to the power of three, so that's much less plutonium that we're talking about. Which would create a sphere only 10 centimeters wide. Yeah. For the first few years, the scientists worked on a bomb with a gun-type design. Inside a gun-type bomb, you have two slabs of uranium-235, both of which are below the critical mass. Then, using a conventional explosive like cordite, you rapidly fire one towards the other, so the combined mass is higher than the critical mass. When the uranium bullet is about 25 centimeters away, the nuclear chain reaction begins, resulting in an atomic explosion. 
In order for this to work, you have to do it very fast. Hence the explosion. And it has to be a very precise, directed explosion in order to get this reaction to occur. There's even a goofy unit they made for this called a shake. A shake is 10 nanoseconds or way, way smaller. 10 nanoseconds is 10 to the minus 8th seconds. So that's why it is very important to be precise. Otherwise, the bomb will fizzle out and it and it won't work. Um, later designs will use, um, like, like such as the Fat Man, will use an, an implosion type device uh, to where it's spherical. So not only does you're approaching the um, two masses together from all angles. Um, the device is a lot more efficient because you take advantage of essentially working in three dimensions instead of two. Despite the simple design, it is not very efficient. Only a small percentage of the uranium undergoes said. fission. <laughs> so the total yield of the bomb is much smaller. You also run into some unexpected problems. Like how do you make sure the uranium slides smoothly through the barrel? Well, you use oil to lubricate the barrel. But all the synthetic oils the scientists tried would dry up. In the end, the only oil they could find that would work was the oil from sperm whales. This I interestingly didn't know, because I, I knew about the sperm whale, but I didn't know about the drying up bit. The synthetic oil, I mean, I just figured World War II, everything is in short supply and ration and we're doing everything we could but this is an interesting point also he's doing a good job to explain what i just talked about maybe i i jumped the gun but first time reacting i just wanted to be sure it's, it's covered only about 0.7 percent of naturally occurring uranium is u-235 the fissile yep. fuel for nuclear bombs when u-235 absorbs a neutron it briefly becomes u-236 and then it rips itself roughly in half and releases on average 2.4 neutrons per fission yep 2.4 but when you get right. uranium out of the ground most of it is u-238 which doesn't undergo fission under normal conditions, uh, fast neutrons will fission U-238, uh, but they're few and far between in a typical nuclear reaction. But some U-238 does, does indeed fission. It is called fissionable, which means it's possible to fission, as opposed to fissile, which means it'll fission pretty easily. So to make a nuclear bomb, the scientists used gigantic mass spectrometers to separate out and concentrate yep. the U-235. And the resulting substance was uranium with a much higher concentration of U-235. In other words, it was enriched. There was another option, though. In early 1941, a new element was discovered, or rather, synthesized. When a neutron Plutonium. is absorbed by a nucleus of uranium-238, it turns into uranium-239. U-239 is unstable, so it decays into neptunium, which then becomes plutonium. Those are two uh, beta decays. A, be a beta particle is an electron. So remember how I said a neutron was effectively a proton and an electron? Well, you lose the, the electron, so the mass number stays the same of uh, 239, but two beta decays, you get two more protons. So the atomic number goes up first to neptunium and then plutonium and lo and behold, you have plutonium. There is a way to make a bomb using plutonium. Critical mass changes depending on the density of the material. Under normal pressure conditions, six kilograms of plutonium 239 won't explode, but if you compress it, the atoms get closer together, and the chance of a stray neutron hitting the nucleus increases. So the higher the density, the lower the critical mass. So if you set off conventional explosives around a ball of plutonium, like you can get earlier. it compressed yep. enough to start a nuclear chain reaction. And this was the whole idea behind the implosion bomb design. While we're on the subject of obscure units, I also um, there's shakes, like I mentioned earlier, and he described about how, how fast this has to occur. There's also barns, which is 10 to the minus 24th, and the unit is per unit area. It's a bizarre unit, but um, think of it as a cross-sectional target. That's why they called it barns, uh, trying to hit the broad side of a barn. So 10 to the minus 24th is a very, very small number, but you're dealing with atoms, so you're dealing with 
Avogadro's constant, which is about 6 times 10 to the 23rd instances. So this, this extremely low probability, you have a probability of 10 to the minus 24th, but you're playing the game 10 to the 23rd times per um, very, very quickly. It's going to happen. There are a couple ways to cheat, lowering the critical mass. For one thing, you surround the sphere with a material that reflects neutrons, decreasing the amount of nuclear fuel you need to start a chain reaction. Yep. You can also have a neutron source, something that kickstarts the chain reaction. For the first implosion bomb, scientists created a device called the urchin, which was a tiny pellet weighing just seven grams, and it would sit at the heart of the bomb. It was made of beryllium and polonium, separated by a layer of nickel and gold. The idea was that when the explosives detonated, the shock wave would mix the beryllium and polonium together, and then the alpha particles from polonium would cause the beryllium to release a flood of neutrons. Which beryllium is typically used, you can also, you, there's also um, plutonium beryllium beryllium sources, or pube sources, as some people call them, that I've seen used in laboratory conditions. ...set off the nuclear chain reaction. At least, that was the hope. An atomic bomb had never been made before. Oppenheimer and the rest of the scientists at Los Alamos needed to act quickly. It was already 1945, and Truman wanted to test the weapon before the start of the Potsdam Conference. That's where Truman, Churchill, and Stalin would come together to plan the post-war peace. The conference began on the 17th of July. The earliest date that everything could be ready for the bomb was just one day earlier. So that is when the test was scheduled. It was codenamed Trinity. Yep. The night before, Oppenheimer was nervous. There were so many things that could go wrong. The last test firing of the explosives, without the actual plutonium core, was a failure. To calm himself, he recited a stanza from the Bhagavad Gita, the sacred Hindu poem. He had actually translated the Gita from the original Sanskrit himself. In battle, in forest, cool. at the precipice in the mountains, on the dark great sea, in the midst of javelins and arrows, in sleep, in confusion, in the depths of shame, the good deeds a man has done before defend him. Perhaps more terrifying than the idea of the bomb not working was that it would work too well. Yeah. Around 1942, Oppenheimer discussed with Arthur Compton a terrible possibility that a nuclear test could end the world. The worry was that the nuclear bomb would create temperatures so hot that fusion would occur. I'll link a video where I talked a bit more about this in detail, but to fuse the nitrogen in the atmosphere, you need a combinate, you need extremely high pressures, temperatures, and you also got to hold it together. Those are the three basic things you need to cause fusion. And they didn't really have any of that. I mean, they had some temperature from the bomb, but it was at ex extremely short range and you couldn't even get, generate enough pressure to do this on the sun. You can fuse nitrogen or elements of that um, size on a much larger star towards the end of its fuel cycle, but they really had no chance. A tiny fraction of the atmosphere, just one part in two million, is hydrogen gas. But the worry was that at high enough temperatures and pressures, that hydrogen could fuse together, releasing energy. This energy would fuse more hydrogen. It could also break apart the hydrogen from water vapor, causing that to fuse as well. That would release even more energy, causing yet more fusion, until the entirety of the Earth's atmosphere would become a giant fusion bomb. Recalling his- Or basically a star. Conversations with Oppenheimer. In 1959, Compton said, nor was this all that Oppenheimer feared. The nitrogen in the air is also unstable, though in less degree. Might not it too be set off by an atomic explosion in the atmosphere? Most of the scientists quickly realized how unlikely this scenario was, yes. and they continued on with the project. So no one took the idea too seriously. 
but the thought of starting a fusion reaction with a fission weapon would become very important after the war. Yep, and that's how later nuclear weapons were made. But yeah, it, it was largely, it was just a brief thought that was largely discredited by the same guys. But I think these guys were just more curious than anything else. It's like, hey, what would it really take? And they're like, okay, I, th I think we're good. The Trinity test was scheduled for 4 a.m., but it was delayed due to a storm. So at 5, 29, and 21 seconds, the gadget, the world's first nuclear bomb, detonated. The high explosive squeezed the core of plutonium inwards. The shockwave mixed the beryllium and polonium, releasing a flood of neutrons. The urchin worked. It jump-started the nuclear reaction, and now there was no way to stop it. Just six kilograms of plutonium created an explosion that was equivalent to nearly 25,000 tons of TNT. The New Mexico mountains were illuminated brighter than in day- well, Trinity was smaller than that. We're talking on the order of 16 to uh, 20 kilotons. Time. The shockwave was felt from over 160 kilometers away. The mushroom cloud rose to 12 kilometers into the sky. It was so hot that the desert sand melted into a glassy mineral now known as trinitite. <laughs> Fortunately, the blast did not set fire to the atmosphere. Yeah. On August 6, 1945, the Boeing B-29 Flying Fortress dropped Little Boy, a gun-type nuclear bomb with... That plane in and of itself was its own engineering marvel. I mean, having a pressurized cabin back then was, was really cool. Very long-range uh, bomber. 64 kilograms of enriched uranium. The nitrocellulose ignited, pushing the slugs of uranium-235 together, tipping it over its critical mass. The blast from the explosion, equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT, killed nearly 70,000 people. Another 70,000 would die from burns and radiation poisoning in the following months. Three days later, an implosion-type bomb, like the gadget, was dropped on Nagasaki, killing an estimated 80,000 more people. More than 95% of the 225,000 people killed in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were civilians. Most were women and children. That's just, that's just horrific. Um, yeah, crazy horrific weapon. Though I will say, um, compared to a lot of other airstrikes, civilian killings in World War II, um, even American airstrikes, firebombings on Tokyo killed a similar number of people. I don't think it was 200,000, but um, this was a very, what was t especially terrifying was just how efficient just one bomb, not, mul not an entire wing of bombers dropping multiple bombs at once. So um, while the atomic bombs didn't kill that many people relative to the horrific um, killings that occurred in World War II, that's why it was so terrifying was because it was so quick. One clarification, Majority of people died from the fireball, the heat, the, uh, the thermal pulse, and the shock wave. Many people died from radiation, but not as much radiation as a lot of people think. Uh, these bombs were airburst weapons, which means a lot of the radiation was just blown up into the upper atmosphere, and there wasn't as much, f there wasn't really that much fallout um, in the grand scheme of things. Now, if they were detonated on the surface, the contamination, the fallout would have been significantly worse. In 1965, recalling the moments after the Trinity test, Oppenheimer said that he thought of another verse from the Gita. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form. I can feel the emotion of what he's saying. It's very... Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
One other translation I've heard of I become death, the shatterer of worlds, just even more. That word to me has even more impact as far as what it does. And you can you can tell in hearing him speak the the emotion he, he must have felt. I, I couldn't imagine. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. After the war, Oppenheimer was a national hero. His portrait was on the cover of Time magazine, and he became a household name. In 1947, he became the director of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He also became the chairman of the General Advisory Committee, where he became an advisor on nuclear weapons-related issues. He used his position to argue for arms control. Yeah. <laughs> In August 1949, the Soviet Union tested their first atomic weapon. And the US military quickly decided that the best course of action was to develop a more powerful bomb, the hydrogen bomb known as the super. Oppenheimer was against the development of the super on ethical grounds and the worry that it would start an arms race. Which but Truman's did. administration pushed through, and three years later, Ivy Mike, the first hydrogen bomb, was tested in the Marshall Islands. It had a yield of 10.4 megatons of TNT. That's 400 times more powerful than the Trinity test. And that right there is the power of combining fission and fusion, and all that energy packed up in, into this one crazy weapon. Yeah, the... The, these things are crazy. And that's also extremely high. Most nuclear weapons, uh, modern nuclear weapons, aren't that powerful. Um, we're on like the 400 to 800 kiloton range. There, there's a few um, in, in the megatons. The biggest ever SAR bomber by the Soviets was 50 megatons. But that was more of an impractical propaganda show weapon of let's we're going to build this really big bomb and test it. Fear us kind of thing. Because... Weapons like that would be so easy to intercept. It had to be on this big, slow, lumbering bomber that you could send fighters out to easily intercept because it would have this big radar cross-section and all that sort of thing. But the first ones were, were big. And a lot of times when they tested, they were bigger than they thought they were, which, yeah. <laughs> A hydrogen bomb is actually three bombs in one. A conventional bomb, a fission bomb, and a fusion bomb. The conventional explosives trigger a fission reaction, which increases the temperature and pressure enough to fuse deuterium and tritium together, releasing a huge amount of energy. In 1961, the Soviet Union tested the Tsar Bomba, the most powerful explosion ever detonated. It was didn't think you'd talk about this. I probably could have waited. <laughs> five times more powerful than Ivy Mike, around 2,000 times more powerful than Trinity. The Soviets had an untested version that was at um, 100 megatons, but they decided not to test that because it the bomber wouldn't be able to safely fly away in time. This kind of arms race was exactly what Oppenheimer had feared. Oppenheimer was essentially put on trial to revoke his security clearance. He had been surveilled while he was working for the Manhattan Project, wow. but that surveillance didn't stop after he left. In December 1953, Oppenheimer had his security clearance suspended. Red, that Red Scare in the 1950s and 60s was very, very popular, and it caused a lot of crazy things to occur. His face, now grim and in black and white, was once again on the cover of Time. His security hearings were international news. It certainly was always assumed at Los Alamos that uh, if the war were not over and not clearly to be brought to a conclusion by diplomatic means, uh, this weapon would play a part. At the time, the alternative, the campaign of invasion, was certainly much more terrible for everyone concerned. I think that Hiroshima was far more costly in life and suffering and inhumane than it needed to have been. 
This reminds me of the quote by Buckminster Fuller. Um, Those that play with the devil's toys will be wrought by degrees to wield his sword. Let me know what you think of that. And can only imagine what you must be going through and just see the emotional roller coaster of having your, your project, your experiment be so successful. It's that gone horribly right, realizing your worst fear is that you started an arms race. It have been an effective argument for ending the war. This is easy to say after the fact. Very heavy, quite harrowing stuff. I couldn't imagine having developed something that could, you know, trigger a horrific arms race and cause so much fear in the world. Um, but the good news is we have peaceful uses of nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power plants generating safe, clean, reliable, carbon-free, sustainable energy for the long term. So hey, if you like this video, please join me on my journey to a clean nuclear energy future by liking, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.